started here. Um, welcome everybody uh, to this fellows lecture tonight. Um, thank you for joining us to hear this talk by Dr. Matthew Hoskin entitled, It's Always Personal, Church Fathers, Nestorianism, and the Christian Life. I'm Robin Harris and I'm the Communications Director here at the Davna Institute. Uh, at the Davna Institute, our mission is to renew the contemporary church uh, by preserving the wisdom of classical Protestantism and making it accessible to people today. Uh, so we do a number of things as a part of this mission. We publish books, including many translations and modernizations of forgotten works of the Reformation. We have a residential study center in the foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountains in South Carolina, where we host events and invite people to come study and pray and build community with like-minded Christians. And of course, we run Davenant Hall, a full graduate level college where we bring in prominent scholars and academics to teach classes on biblical studies, philosophy, systematic theology, ethics, literature, and much more. So one of the things we do regularly to give people a taste of Davenant Hall is that we invite some of our scholars to present some of their research and experts. Oh, we've lost. Okay, I think she's on her way back. She's connecting to audio. Um, hopefully, we'll have Robin back in a moment. Um, so, but yes, it's an exciting fellows lecture um, where, yes, this is actually my third time doing one of these. And it is an opportunity to sort of give you guys a taster of what sorts of things we do at Davenant Hall, um, sort of sharing with you also sometimes sort of what is the current research that we faculty are working on, but then sort of showing you how that these things that we are reading um, in the rest of the time when we're not lecturing sort of trickle down into what we're teaching. So it's really exciting to do that. And so I have uh, the work from my perspective sort of have had the opportunity of doing this is now my third. And so I've always sort of geared it actually to a topic that is related to my upcoming teaching. So people can sort of see what sorts of things are going on if they like what I say, how I say it. And that sort of thing, and perhaps what sorts of topics I do, or well, maybe you could sign up for one of my courses. And I'm sure my colleagues um, have also done that sort of approach um, for themselves as well. Um, well, Robin continues to have uh, some difficulties. Um, I'll introduce myself as well. So I am Dr. Matthew Hoskin. I am professor of Christian history at Davenant Hall. I have been, this coming January will be two years that I've been teaching for Davenant Hall almost nonstop, um, and I love it a lot. It's a wonderful place to work. I have a PhD from the University of Edinburgh from the year 2015. Uh, that PhD focused, the thesis focused on the letters of Pope Leo the Great and their transmission, uh, sort of looking at the manuscripts in sort of really big broad categories and where and when they were placed, as well as the nitty gritty in terms of textual criticism. I do other things mostly related to late antiquity, canon law, the history of the papacy, and Latin theology in terms of research, but I get to teach broadly across patristics and even into the Middle Ages for Daventhal, which is a great joy and a great delight. So I live in Thunder Bay, Ontario as well, um, buried under about five miles of snow right now, I think. So uh, that's the excuse for my hair today is that I spent all day shoveling. Uh, so that's why it is more vast uh, in size than normal this evening um, and why the curls aren't quite so tight as perhaps one would prefer. So that's sort of just a little bit about me and I will be teaching in January uh, the theological world of the Nicene controversy coming up in Hillary term. Hopefully, if you like what you hear tonight, you can sign up for that course, whether to audit or to come uh, and come to lectures live and uh, as a student for credit and join our program at Davenant Hall. So I'm going to begin now. And I always, because all of life is worship in different ways, I always start my lectures with a prayer. So begin first with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, 
and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And then I'm going to begin with a seasonal collect, the collect for Christmas Day from the Book of Common Prayer. Almighty God, who hast given us thy only begotten Son to take our nature upon him, and as at this time to be born of a pure virgin, grant that we, being regenerate and made thy children by adoption and grace, may daily be renewed by thy Holy Spirit, through the same our Lord Jesus Christ, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the same Spirit, ever one God, world without end. Amen. So, and I would now like to again thank my colleagues at the Davenant Institute for letting me give the December Fellows Lecture for the third time in a row. And for the third time, I am talking about the inexhaustible topic of the incarnation of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So you may call this On the Incarnation Part 3. And I realize, of course, that liturgically speaking, I ought to have prayed the Collect Radin 4 at the beginning of this, today still being December 22nd. But the Collect for Christmas Day is always a prayer worth praying. And it touches on some of the important questions of tonight's lecture, namely that God the Son took our nature upon him, and that we are, re we are regenerate and made God's children by adoption and grace. My prayer is that this lecture will help you sing those Christmas hymns on Saturday night and Sunday morning with gusto. Whether you're singing, God of God, light of light, lo, he abhors not the virgin's womb. Very God begotten, not created. Or of the Father's Love Begotten by Prudentius, which I will not be attempting my plain song and inflicting that upon you. And besides helping you sing with gusto the deep truths of the Christmas carols, help you live out the petition of the Collect for Christmas Day by the grace of God through your own union with Christ. That petition being that we may daily be renewed by the Holy Spirit. So the specific historical moment I want to begin with is 428 with the accession of a man named Nestorius to the Episcopacy of Constantinople and the problems that arose from his teaching. But rather than look at St. Cyril's response, as I did two years ago, in fact, or at Leo the Great's consolidation of the tradition, as I did last year, I'm going to look at the halls of the monasteries and the opposition to Nestorianism from three monastic fathers, St. John Cassian of Marseille, St. Shanuti of Atrape in Upper Egypt, and St. Mark the Monk of Syria. Cassian wrote in Latin, Shanuti in Coptic, and Mark in Greek. Each of these writers lays part of his tradition's foundations for monasticism to this day, and the corpus of each is primarily concerned with ascetic and mystical concerns. The discussion tonight will proceed chronologically. First, what is Nestorianism? Second, John Cassian, third, Shanuti, and fourth, Mark the Monk. It is important in a discussion such as this, from the get-go to make a distinction between Nestorius himself and Nestorianism. This is because penetrating what Nestorius really meant in 428 when he said Nestorian things is not as straightforward as identifying what his opponents found heretical. That Nestorius in 451 seems to some readers to have expressed a theology in accord with the Council of Chalcedon and thus official orthodoxy does not mean that 23 years earlier his beliefs were in line. Certainly, the things he said were susceptible to heretical interpretation, and it is that interpretation that tonight's monks resisted. It is the ism of Nestorius that we are concerned with, not what modern scholars attempt to reconstruct of the actual beliefs of the man himself. So what then is Nestorianism? Nestorianism is the belief that in Christ there are two persons, or prosopa, one human and one divine, and these are hitched together with a conjunction, sunephea, rather than fully united through a union, henosis. 
Synophea is the same Greek word that you would use about hitching a horse to a wagon. These two things may work together, but they are two separate entities. Each of them ends up as the acting subject of different things. And so in the case of Christ, the divine does divine things, the human does human things. Each of them is the acting subject of the things that Jesus does. It has been called the pantomime horse Christology, a nice seasonal reference for you. Nestorianism avoids talking about the hypostatic union. The hypostatic union is the idea that the human and divine in Christ are so closely united that there is only one acting subject. Cyril of Alexandria would say that this subject is the God word incarnate. Today, we might say Christ in order to avoid sounding Apollinarian or even Neo-Apollinarian. That, that being the teaching that the incarnate Christ had no human soul, but that the God word took the place of that soul. Um, so Nestorianism rejects that. It also rejects things like the title Theotokos of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Uh, sort of, we might think of him as a pre-Nestorian for our purposes tonight, a man made by the name of Diodor of Tarsus, even went so far as to say that he would never dare to say that God was born of a woman. The orthodoxy of the 5th century, on the other hand, says that the baby born in Bethlehem was the incarnate God. Therefore, St. Mary the Virgin is the God-bearer, the Theotokos, or in Latin, she is the Genetrix Dei, the Mother of God. These titles are not to glorify the Blessed Virgin, but to highlight the glory of her son, that he was always God from the moment of conception, and before that too. These are the sorts of things Nestorius said, regardless of what some interpreters today claim he meant. And when he started saying these things in 428, soon after becoming Bishop of Constantinople, people started circulating the most damning of his sermons, and that gained him enemies, most notably St. Cyril of Alexandria. <coughs> Sorry. But a dossier of Nestorius' work also made its way to Rome before St. Cyril got in touch with Pope Celestine I about the trouble. At the request of Celestine's Archdeacon Leo, future Pope and subject of my PhD dissertation, Cassian, a bilingual Dacian, bilingual people being increasingly rare in the fifth century, from modern Romania, gave a response to this Greek controversy, the seven books on the incarnation against Nestorius. So who is John Cassian and what did he say? John Cassian was a monastic with a Mediterranean spanning career. He left his home in the Balkans and became a monk at Bethlehem. he had spent 10 years amongst the desert fathers of Egypt where he was a disciple of Evagrius Ponticus. He fled in exile to Constantinople around the year 400, where Chrysostom made him a deacon. He left when Chrysostom went into exile in 404, and he spent some time in Rome, where he was made priest by Pope Innocent I, and then settled in Marseille, where he founded a monastery. His remains are still in Marseille at the Abbe Sainte Victoire. Whilst in Gaul, he wrote some of the foundational texts for Latin monasticism, the Institutes of the Koinobia and Remedies for the Eight Principal Vices is one, and the Conferences is the other. These works were influential from the get-go, from the fifth century Jura Fathers of Gaul to the rule of St. Benedict and on to today. Thomas Merton lectured on Cassian to the novices of Gethsemane Abbey. He is also the only Latin author included in the massive five-volume anthology of what we say Byzantine spirituality called the Philokalia, compiled by St. Nicodemus of the Holy Mountain in the 1700s. The institutes begin with the externals of monastic life, along with their symbolic meaning. And then the text moves into the... Conferences. The person who has already been doing the work of the institutes is introduced to the telos of the monastic life. The final end of monasticism is to see God. Indeed, that's the final end of the Christian life. The skopos, which is the immediate goal, is purity of heart. As in Matthew 5, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Now, purity of heart for Cassian is a biblical stand-in 
for the teaching of Clement of Alexandria and of Agrius Ponticus on apatheia. This term had become controversial in the 5th century Latin church as a result of the originist controversy. The rest of the conferences proceeds to chart the path and the spiritual teaching towards pure prayer and purity of heart, including demonological discourses in conferences 7 and 8, on which I have an article coming out this January in Studio Monastica. An oft-quoted passage regarding pure prayer comes in conference 10. For then will be brought to fruition in us that prayer of our Savior which he prayed to his Father on his disciples' behalf when he said, The love with which you have loved me may be in them and they in us. And again, that all may be one as you, Father, in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us. Then that perfect love of God by which he loved us first, will have also passed into our heart's disposition upon the fulfillment of this prayer of the Lord, which we believe can in no way be rendered void. This will be the case when every love, every desire, every effort, every undertaking, every thought of ours, everything that we live, that we speak, that we breathe, will be God. And when that unity which the Father now has with the Son and which the Son has with the Father, will be carried over into our understanding and our mind, so that, just as he loves us with a sincere and pure and indissoluble love, we too may be joined to him with a perpetual and inseparable love, and so united with him that whatever we breathe, whatever we understand, whatever we speak, may be God. In him we shall attain, I say, to that end of which we spoke before, which the Lord longed to be fulfilled in us when he prayed, that all may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they themselves may also be made perfect in unity. And again, Father, I wish that those whom you have given me may also be with me where I am. This, then, is the goal of the solitary. Cassian's ascetic teaching is Christocentric overall and throughout. The Soldier of Christ, Miles Christi, Cassian's common gloss for bunk, is in the service of Christ. Service of Christ being a phrase repeated frequently throughout the Institutes. And he has an attitude in this that later on, after 428, could have been classified as anti-Nestorian. The body of the gospel is but one, Cassian writes, embracing as it does the birth as well as the Godhead and the miracles as well as the passion of one and the same Christ. This reference occurs in the midst of Cassian's description of the monastic prayer office of the Eastern Church, which is divided throughout the day in reference to the Passion of Christ. Moreover, the monastic life is designed to empower the soldier of Christ to live in imitation of Christ, especially of his humility, saying that the humility of Christ is the true nobility. Cassian's account for the monastic virtue of discretion at Institutes 5.4, claims to be an account of the teaching of Abba Antony the Great in this regard, and it actually includes some important Christology for us cases. For though we do not as yet see that even Christ has made all things in all, as the Apostle says, still in this way we can find him bit by bit in all, for it is said of him, who was made of God to you wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Well, then, in one there is found wisdom, in another righteousness, in another sanctification, in another kindness, in another chastity, in another humility, in another patience. Christ is at the present time divided, member by member, among all of the saints. But when all come together into the unity of the faith and virtue, he is formed into the perfect man, completing the fullness of his body in the joints and properties of all his members. Until then, that time arrives when God will be all in all. For the present, God can, in the way of which we have spoken, be in all through particular virtues, although he is not yet all in all through the fullness of them. For although our religion has but one end and aim, yet there are different ways by which we approach God, as will be more fully shown in the conferences of the elders, which is ultimately a reference to Conference 10. To sum up what could be this whole lecture, the monk is in the service of Christ as a soldier of Christ, following the example of Christ, obeying the commands of Christ, and also 
And here's the theological payout of this big quotation I just read, united to Christ, part of Christ, participating in the divine life through Christ, however imperfectly now, but aiming for that time when Christ has made all things in all, which we can grasp for here in pure prayers described in Conference 10. Finally, undergirding all of this spiritual theology is grace. Cassian gets unfairly smeared with the term semi-Pelagian, but unlike the ism associated with Pelagius' name, Cassian believes in the necessity of grace for us to be able to be saved and for us to be able to do good works after we are saved. While Conference 13, where he discusses these matters, may not be full-throated Augustinianism, it's not really halfway to Pelagius. Grace is absolutely necessary to salvation and to the monastic life Cassian describes. And that grace is present through Christ, who enables the monk to follow Christ's example and commands. In On the Incarnation, having read a certain amount of Nestorius firsthand, Cassian argues that Nestorianism is, in fact, like Pelagianism. Both of them see the human life of Christ as a perfect man, as something he did simply as a man with no divine assistance. Therefore, human beings today, being of the same species as the human Christ, can also live a perfect, sinless life with no divine assistance. The Christ of Pelagius and Nestorius, in Cassian's view, is not just adoptionist, but also merely an example of good works. On Pelagians, Cassian says the following, thus destroying as far as they could all the good of his sacred advent and all the grace of divine redemption, as they declared that men could by their own lives obtain just that which God had wrought by dying for man's salvation. It may be protested that Nestorius is not strictly speaking adoptionist in any of the surviving fragments of his work, even from as hostile a quoter as St. Cyril of Alexandria. Nevertheless, the ramifications of Nestorianism, when the conjunction between divine and human is so weak that the two are not really united and are still two separate acting subjects, means that the divinity has not in fact taken up humanity into its own life, a major point of St. Athanasius on the Incarnation almost a century previously. This results in no transfiguration of the human by the divine. The Nestorian Christ in practical terms is Ebionite, which believes that Christ was just a mere man or adoptionist. Not fully God, but really just a man living a good life as a good moral example to us. In fact, the Nestorian dossier Cassian had uses the term Theodachos of Christ, God receiver. The result of this being that Christ is not fully God, but a man who received God which is, of course, the implication of saying that he wasn't, that the child born of Mary is not God, then at some point, if we do want to affirm that Christ is the God word, at some point the God word has to have come into him, other than at the point of conception. And the hypostatic union, a doctrine that Cassian expounds in Book 4, and the related doctrine of the communicatio idiomatum, which is the communication or transfer of properties or characteristics between the divine and human in Christ, mean that Jesus, being simultaneously one person who was also God and man in their fullness, was able not just to show us the good life, but to transform the cosmos and empower us by grace to live that good life. He cannot redeem if he is not fully God. In other words, nothing less than asceticism itself is at stake in the monastic battle against Nestorianism a Nestorian Christ makes ascetic endeavor useless. A Nestorian Christ does not help the monk. A Nestorian Christ tells you to pull yourself up to heaven by your bootstraps. Chronologically, our next monk against Nestorius is Shanuti of Atrope, abbot of the White Monastery in Upper, which is to say Southern Egypt, one of the grand authors of classical Sahidic Coptic. Shanuti was one of those extremely long lived monks of the ancient desert. He lived from 348 to 465. He was the abbot of one of Upper Egypt's massive monastic communities, the White Monastery, the headship of which he took over from an abbot named Ebon, who was successor to his uncle, the founder, who founded around 360, of the White Monastery, Pukol. Pukol died in the 370s. 
From 385 until his death, Shanuti was abbot of this monastic federation, which had its own rule, since not only did orders of monks not yet exist, they have never existed in the East. The White Monastery Federation consisted of three monastic settlements, two for monks and one for nuns. By the time Shanuti died, there were 2,200 monks and 1,800 nuns living there. Besides governing the monks and nuns of the three monastic complexes, Shanuti was also a public Christian, giving public discourses, sermons directed at the wider audience of Upper Egypt, including government officials and other Christian leaders. His preaching, his leadership, and his holiness led St. Cyril to consider consecrating Shanuti as a bishop, but this did not come to pass. His literary remains are the discourses, which include both public and monastic sermons, letters, and the monastic rule of the White Monastery. In 431, a year after Cassian's day in Carnatione, as part of the campaign against the teaching of Nestorius, a council was held in Ephesus. Saint Shanuti accompanied Saint Cyril there. Shanuti was the biggest name in, in Egyptian monasticism at the time, and he was Cyril's right-hand monastic man. Unfortunately, the tales about Shanuti at the council as it recounted in Bayes' Life of Shanuti, although they are very entertaining, are certainly not what went on there. Nonetheless, whatever Shanuti did at the council, he agreed with St. Cyril. And we see, uh, we see this in one of his surviving discourses, which is a long anti-heretical tractate called I Am Amazed, that deals with the errors of several heresies. And this is where we find his anti-Nestorian discussion. Like Cassian, Shanuti sees Nestorianism as akin to adoptionist heresies. Those are those heresies that say that Jesus was just a normal guy who then God sort of adopted and made into his son. He takes various statements that sound like the Antiochian Exodus Diodore, Theodore, and Nestorius, who's sort of third in line, I guess you could say, and points out that if you say that Mary did not give birth to God, this is tantamount to making Christ a mere man, saying, and he says that Christ was the word of, was the God word with the Father, not only before he had formed Mary in the womb, his mother according to the divine economy, and his servant according to his divinity, but before he had created a single angel or spirit, and seraph or cherub, and power, and heaven and earth, and sun and moon, and stars and the skies and all those within them, and the sea and all those within it, and as far as the fleas than which there is nothing smaller. Again, it is by his hand that they all came into existence, and without him, nothing came into existence. Shanuti also presents several quotations attributed to, to Nestorius that I have not encountered elsewhere. I'll share with you a couple of those. Saying about Christ, he is a man in whom God dwells, and after he was born of Mary, the word entered him. It's worth pausing here to note that here perhaps we see something that Cassian also had access to, um, because this would explain the use of the term Theodokos, that the human Jesus Christ uh, received God in a special way. And then Shanuti goes on, for he spoke in this way, if you examine all the scriptures, both the old and new, you will not find the one who's crucified called God. And also, Jesus said to his disciples, touch me and see, no ghost has bone or flesh as you see that I have. Thus, were he God, he would say, touch me and see that I am a spirit and I am God. So that's Shanuti quoting Nestorius, allegedly. Um, but the following is assuredly from the circle of Nestorius. It sounds like Nestorius, it sounds like Diodor of Tarsus as well. Therefore, it is not right to say that the virgin bore a god. And another, I will not say that he who was three, that's what the manuscripts say, the manuscripts say three, Obviously, someone wrote wrong. I will not say that he who was three months in the womb is a god and was suckled and advanced bit by bit. These statements undercut the radical union of the person of Christ, whereby Christ takes humanity up into divinity. What has not been assumed, St. Gregor the theologian famously said in Epistle 121, has not been healed. If God was not born of Mary, then Jesus is not fully God, and humanity has not actually been assumed. Humanity has not been healed. 
You can even see the resultant Pelagianism of such a position. In that case, our salvation is up to us. Jesus is just a good example and a great moral teacher. But for Shanuti, Christ is more than that, not just cosmically, as already quoted, but for the spiritual life. In his discourse, A Priest Will Never Cease, Shanuti gives a lengthy description of the church as a place of healing and of Christ as the physician who cleanses the wounds of our sins with his love. Shanuti defines the medicines from Christ in two ways. First, the word of the teaching and the commands, and then Christ's mercies, his compassion, his goodness, his patience, his forbearance, his blessedness, and his love of humanity. Christ cleanses us through the baptism of the Holy Spirit and gives us the medicine of his teachings that we are to listen to and live by. Let us not now receive them and leave them in our ears like medicines in jars, he says. But Christ does not only give the medicines, he makes them efficacious because he is God. Right? He is God united to humanity in this intense, unbreakable union, indivisible is what makes the possibility of holiness real. And so Shanuti says, it is he who gives us the word, and also it is he who gives obedience in the place of teaching. His is the mercy that acts within the heart of the merciful. It is he who created us, it is not us. His is the gold and his is the silver. His are all good things. His is the commandment that he commands that a man not become confident in himself and believe that those acts by which he does good for the poor belong to him. Rather, they belong to Lord Jesus who gave them to him. Christ heals us because he created us. But a Jesus who was not fully God when born or a God who had not fully taken up the whole of humanity, that is not a physician who can heal us, being deficient either in divinity or in humanity. Such teaching that Christ both commands and empowers obedience, thereby healing us, is found throughout the discourses. It is undermined if Christ is not fully God, as Nestorianism implies for Shanuti, or indeed not fully man, which is the Apollinarian view that Shanuti also opposes, and which in a different way can also follow from Nestorianism, with Nestorianism's statements denying that God suckled at his mother's breast, which is an orthodox image put most beautifully by St. Ephraim the Syrian. Moreover, Shanuti also sees us as healed and nourished by the Eucharist. The Holy Communion is a central part of living the saved life, walking by the Spirit, and being cleansed from sin in the ancient church. As early as St. Ignatius of Antioch in the 100s, it is called the medicine of immortality. And St. Cyril of Alexandria teaches that if you don't receive Holy Communion, you won't be saved. Shanuti and the other monks of the desert also believe in the centrality of the Eucharist, having provision for priests and churches in their monastic communities so the monks can receive weekly communion. Even the hermits typically lived near enough a church to be able to go to communion on Sunday morning. Shanuti argues for the real presence of Christ in the bread and wine and says, we believe that it is his body and his blood and we will not disbelieve that it is the true bread that came from heaven. Bread and water is life for the bodies of humanity, but the body and the blood of the Lord is spiritual life for the bodies, for his body is true food and his blood is true drink. For he says, bless the children of men with bodily nourishment and bodily drink. Those who believe well are blessed with spiritual food and spiritual drink. The body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, our life and our hope and our blessing, the Lord and God himself and his son. Shanuti teaches essentially the same thing as St. As Cyril in Cyril's homilies on John, which I discussed two years ago. And this means that Christ needs to be fully man and fully God for the Holy Communion to be real and efficacious, a teaching he shares with Mark the Monk. So Mark the Monk then is our final monk of the night. Mark is later than either of these two, but his dates are a bit uncertain in part because, well, there is more than one Greek monk named Mark. Uh, his writings have been narrowed, narrowed down to after Chalcedon in 451, the Council of Chalcedon, and before 485. Mark is a widely influential ascetic writer. His diptych of On the Spiritual Law, 
and all those who imagine they are justified by works are, like Cassian, included in the Philokalia Volume 1 which is a sign that they were read and copied in the monasteries of Greek Christianity for a millennium. He was read by Byzantine luminaries such as Nikitas Stethotos and Simeon the New Theologian, and he was included in Paul Evergetinos' Synagoge in the 11th century. A Greek copy of On the Spiritual Law with Latin interlinear gloss was made at Sankt Gall around 850. And to the east of his homeland, he is cited by the Syriac luminary St. Isaac of Nineveh. Those are just a few of the many examples of Mark being read in the Middle Ages, Greek, Latin, and Syriac. Mark is best known in any language for that diptych included in the Philokalia. These two works are a genre called kephalaya, um, or headings, or chapters. And this is a, it's sort of like if you are acquainted with the sayings of the Desert Fathers, where it's just sort of a short, brief, pithy saying. That's what these are, except they're rather than sort of gathered and anthologized from a bunch of different people, they are carefully composed and arranged by a single person. And so then there are all sorts of interesting benefits to reading this kind of uh, literature. And a lot of the texts in the first volume of the Philokalia follow this sort of pattern. It's a genre used by Evagrius, a genre used by St. Simeon the New Theologian, and also by St. Gregory Palamas. So that is partly to explain to you the sorts of quotations you're about to get as I go through St. Mark. So in the first part of this diptych on the spiritual law, Mark discusses the spiritual law of Christ, which he calls the law of freedom as well. And this is the law according to which the redeemed live. This law is found in scripture, and scripture is not truly or properly read unless it is also thereby lived. And how do we live this law? Well, we are sinners convicted of crime against God, which means that we are only capable of living according to this law by his grace and only by trust in him. So uh, chapter one, the very first chapter of on the spiritual law says, first of all, we know that God is the beginning and middle and end of everything good. And it is impossible to do or believe anything good except through Christ Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Mark goes on to discuss the law of freedom later on. The law of freedom teaches the whole truth. This is chapter 28. Many people study this law according to the dictates of knowledge, but few people understand that it is measured by practicing the commandments. And then immediately to chapter 29. Do not look for this law as being perfected through human virtues. Perfection is not found in human virtues. Its perfection is hidden in the cross of Christ. And then chapter 30. The law of freedom is studied by means of true knowledge, is understood through the practice of the commandments, and is brought to fulfillment through the mercies of our Lord Jesus Christ. Various pieces of spiritual or ascetic advice comprise much of the bulk of on the spiritual law. Lest you become afraid that Mark is advocating for works righteousness, in the second treatise, on those who imagine they are justified by works, he puts a lot of emphasis on the necessity for grace in the Christian life, saying that we do not merit salvation by our good works, and that we are justified before God by our faith in Christ. And he says this in various different ways throughout the text, um, that yes, it is faith that justifies us, and it is God's grace that empowers us to do any good works that we ever do. And we are not simply saved from the penalty of sin in Mark's work, and he is a notable Greek father for his use of forensic imagery. We are also caught up into the divine, as he articulated in his letter to Nicholas, chapter 9. All the punishments imposed upon humankind by divine decree for the sin of transgression, death, toil, hunger, thirst, and the like, he took upon himself, becoming what we are, so that we might become what he is. And then, later on in the same chapter, Mark shows us the outworking of that final Irenaean and Athanasian phrase in a manner consistent with the thinking of the Greek fathers. From the time that Christ came to dwell with us, the new humanity, made in the image and likeness, is truly made new through the grace and power of the Spirit, reaching the full measure of perfect love which casts out fear and is no longer able to fall, for love never fails. What then does Mark have to say about Nestorius? Um, well, 
He deals with historianism in a treatise with a title that's really worthy of the 16th or 17th century. On the Incarnation, a doctrinal treatise addressed to those who say that the holy flesh was not united with the word, but rather partially, partially clothed it like a coat. Because of this, they say, the person wearing the garment was different from the garment being worn. That's actually nothing compared to what some 17th century guys do. In this, Mark, I'm not saying that Shenudi and Cassian were wrong, but what we today describe as Nestorianism is what Mark is engaging with. While Nestorianism may be tantamount to saying that Jesus is a mere man, it is actually the teaching that divides the human from the divine in Christ. It is a teaching, as the genuine quotations in Shenudi show, that does not allow us to predicate any of the human properties of Jesus Christ to the God word. It, uh, it abrogates the communicatio idiomatum, that important corollary of the hypostatic union, this transfer of properties between the divine and the human. So not only do we not get to say all the Christmas things from St. Ephraim about how he as God made the milk that was sustaining him, we also cannot say that they crucified the Lord of glory. Wait, hold the phone. That's in scripture. Well, Mark sets out to demonstrate that none of the saints and spirit-bearing men, by which he means prophets and apostles, dared to divide as an entity him who had been united in a manner worthy of God in accordance with the Father's good pleasure. In various ways, extensively using many, many passages from scripture, Mark demonstrates how the scriptures teach the fullness of human and divine and their union in Christ. Mark argues that the suffering and death of Christ were saving, they were salvific, precisely because it was real flesh that suffered and real God. God did suffer in the person of Jesus Christ. The hypostatic union, in other words, guarantees our salvation because we need a human to save humans, to take the penalty of humanity for our own sin, but no mere human is actually able to do that. Only God can do that. And this today, of course, is Christology 101. This is, you know, the end of Anselm's Cur Deus Homo. Mark goes to great lengths to point out the hypostatic union and what it means against dividing the natures. He also gets into soteriology um, in another angle, because soteriology is always the underlying concern for Christology. He says, if Christ has not assumed our flesh in substantive reality, how will he give us the gift of the spirit? We believe Holy Scripture. When God the Word was pleased to become human, he did not turn himself into flesh, but rather united human flesh to himself. By doing this, he made every human being capable of receiving the Holy Spirit. He himself, by virtue of this union, assumed flesh as God, while we, by participation, receive the Spirit as human beings. And one of the things that we see here is that um, because of the incarnation, first of all, because of the incarnation of how he took the human and united it inseparably to the divinity, we are able to receive the Holy Spirit. Without the incarnation, we are not able because our human nature remains lifeless and dead because of the penalty of our sin. That's one thing. The other thing he's doing here is showing what makes Orthodox Christology different from Nestorianism. He is showing that we, human beings, human beings we receive the Holy Spirit as a gift from God. In the incarnation, though, he's not the Theodokos. He's not the God receiver. He is God himself taking humanity up into his divine life. It's a completely different thing. Moreover, for Mark, as for Saints Cyril and Shanuti, the hypostatic union secures the life-giving grace of the Holy Communion. For as he points out, he goes, he actually has this long discussion of how baptism and the Holy Communion necessitate Orthodox Christology. And so in his discussion of communion, he points out that the, the priest calls it the holy body of Jesus Christ for eternal life. And that is meaningless if that body is not united to the divinity. The entire spiritual program of Mark's ascetic works is undermined by the Nestorian division of Christ. We are saved and sanctified by the whole Christ, a single person of united divinity and humanity. His death washes us clean from sin and his incarnate reality enables us to receive the grace of holiness through baptism through the subsequent indwelling of the holy spirit and through the holy communion so some concluding remarks 
In all three monastic authors, we find a concern for holy living empowered by Christ's life-giving grace. They embrace to the full the cosmic reality of the Nicene teaching of the incarnate Christ being the God word from eternity. And this cosmic truth is what brings the power to our lives. We aren't simply trusting in a mere man. Our sins are not washed clean by a mere man. We are not united to God by a mere man. No, this is God himself who took humanity into himself and into the divine life through the incarnation. And this transfigures our hearts and lives. The entire ascetic enterprise is made possible by the incarnation of the one true and living God. If Christ is not fully and powerfully God, then everything is meaningless. There is no holiness. You will never reach pure prayer. You will never have union with God because the human Jesus did not. He was bifurcated. The word never became flesh. The Lord of glory was not crucified. You are thus dead in your sins. This is the entire foundation of monasticism. For the monastic life is not about me and my effort, but about pursuing God with single-mindedness, being monotropos. Any of the things a monk does are meant to bring him closer to God, but God is the one who empowers that monastic move. God is the one who makes clean the luminous eye and ushers us into the throne room of heaven. And all of this is possible because of the incarnation of God the Son as a real, complete human being in perfect, indivisible unity. And so, today, three days from Christmas, allow me to close with a passage from the other major patristic language, Syriac, jumping ahead, well, not that far from Mark the Monk, to St. Jacob of Sarug and his second homily on the Nativity, which is a verse homily, similar to some of the work of St. Ephraim. Why did the great and eternal sun come down, and even to come a second time according to corporeal birth? What is the reason that after the chariot, he would dwell in the manger? And after majesty, why should he come to the confines of smallness? That adversary who had wanted to become God in rebellion stole away greatness that was not his. Then the magnificent one wished by bringing himself down to smallness to take up his own from the rebellious one and to scoff at him. And because he had wanted to become God boldly, God descended and became a human humbly. Because he had seen that Adam had fallen from the noble rank, he carried in his person the body of Adam, and he was made victorious in him. He humbled himself in response to the haughtiness to which the demons had raised themselves, so that they might become a laughing stock of the smallness that prevailed over them. And that one who had become arrogant when he exalted himself up to become a god, the newborn babe who was laid in the manger, overthrew and trampled upon his crown. A suckling, whom Mary girded round in swaddling clothes, dashed into pieces all the idols of the earth and removed them. The silent babe who was bound and laid in the neglected manger bound the tyrant and subdued the strength of his rebelliousness. The son of the virgin overthrew in the contest that mighty one who had enslaved the generations to vanity, making him a mockery. Thank you very much. I think now there's going to be a three minute break for me to recover my voice and for you to rally your, the troops for questions. So I'm just gonna mute myself and uh, stretch a little and then I'll be back in three minutes. <clears throat> All right, we have oh, time for the questions is beginning now. Um, our first question that has come up uh, and it says, excellent presentation. I say, thank you very much, Joshua. Given the pre prevalence of gender ideology in this day and age, what do you think the reality of the hypostatic union has to say to those Christians who would embrace transgenderism at all? And do you think they are guilty by virtue of this, of a sort of implicit Nestorianism themselves? This is a good, this is an interesting question um, that sort of, I think it is actually worthwhile to be thinking about these sorts of things, even though I'm rarely the guy who does. But 
I think one of the things we have to realize is um, when you think about the wholeness of the of the man, see, I use that word man, of the man Jesus Christ. Um, he is a full and perfect human, right? So he's a perfect anthropos, is of course what all of the councils have to say. That's what the Council of Chalcedon talks about how he is a perfect anthropos, or in Latin, a homo, um, which could be for a male or a female, but he is in his perfection. He is a male, right? He is a man in both senses of the English word. And he has this, therefore, this particularity, which is necessary to his fullness as a human, which is something that the ancients, of course, most of the ancient church would have agreed, certainly within those who were within the bounds of orthodoxy on these questions, would have said that, yes, Jesus, in order to be fully human, has to be male or female, and he is male. Um, he is a man. Um, so that is sort of when we think about that, and that one of the important things about, when we think about the union according to hypostasis, the henosis kat um, this this beautiful teaching about how Christ operates is that, of course, there are always analogies being made. How can two things be one, right? This, uh, if those of you who do 16th century stuff have, are in the mood, you should read Peter Martyr from Migley's On the Two Natures of Christ. It's, it's magnificent. Um, and he gets into this, he just spends a lot of time in terms of analysis with the fathers, and one of the things that, uh, one of the analogies that everybody makes when they talk about how can you have both the human and the divine, yet only a single hypostasis, a single persona, uh, how does that actually, how does that work? It's like, well, a human being is at the very least soul and body, perhaps spirit, soul, and body, or heart, mind, soul, and strength, right? We ourselves are more than one thing, but nevertheless, we are, as complex creatures, we are still, there's a complete and utter union that you can't divide, right? And so then that means that if you are an embodied person, and this is where these questions of how does hypostatic union look at um, work, and you start trying to look at parallels with the human person, um, as people with sexed bodies, male and female, aren't random categories for our ensouled the ensouled part of us, basically. Uh, the human soul is itself dwelling within a, a body that is male or female, and that therefore um, we cannot fully embrace. I'm willing to say that there's some sort of brokenness out there in the world that I don't understand about what like actual gender dysphoria and how that actually works and why there are men out there who are, like men who fight this, who don't want to give in to the ideology, but who nevertheless feel a repulsion over their body hair, unlike me. I have a lot. I actually don't have a lot elsewhere, but my head is my prime example. Um, but these things are nevertheless going on, um, going on out there. And I, so I'm not going to like, I'm not a psychologist. I don't understand how gender dysphoria works. Um, but nevertheless, I would say that this is sort of, I think it is sort of an historianizing tendency towards ourselves, right? So if we take these parallels, just like you can find these parallels in the human person, um, they come from a deep meditation of what does it mean for the three persons of the Trinity to be persons can show you what it means for us to be persons. So if we meditate on the hypostatic union, what does it mean for Christ to be a single person who has these two natures so we can see what it means for us? And so, yes, the uh, transgenderism, I would argue, is a form of Nestorian human nature. Um, so um, good question, Joshua. And next question coming up, um, Christian asks, uh, what is the Nestorian adoptionist understanding of the Trinity? Is it about the same but severed from Christology or do the implications affect the view of the Trinity? From what I have seen from anyone um, sort of in what we might call the Nestorian camp of Trinitarian theology, they would, um, certainly Nestorian type folks, would affirm at this point in history the Nicene Trinitarian theology, where we're thinking the predecessors of Nestorius, like Diodor and Theodore, Diodor of, Tar of Tarsus, and Theodore of Mopsuestia, or Nestorius himself. They don't talk in sort of in sorts of things I read that are generally, of course, we're looking at their Christology, not at their uh, Trinitarian theology. But it is, I would say, orthodox as far as it goes. But that, yes, it is sort of 
severed from Christology. And I would argue that it doesn't affect the Trinity. I know these are like modern terms and people get mad at each other on Twitter over this, but um, it doesn't affect the way we view the Trinity in terms of the, what you might call the imminent Trinity in terms of the divine relations. But I would argue that it could affect the divine economy, um, the, the way we encounter God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that you come sort of to the Father through the Son and in the Holy Spirit. Um, that we all of a sudden, the Son is not deeply united to us and the Holy Spirit can't indwell us as a result of this Christology. And so our encounter of God, the Holy Trinity, is weakened by a Nestorian Christology. So that's what I would argue. So it's not actually the ability of someone like Nestorius to sign off on the Nicene Creed is not affected um, by his Christology. I say that, but of course, John Cassian, actually one of the things I didn't get into in the lecture, in Cassian's On the Incarnation against Nestorius, he actually charges Nestorius for, with abrogating the baptismal covenant of the Church of Antioch, which would include Trinitarian statements. Um, but mostly he says that he does this in terms of abrogating that I, you know, the I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ part of it, not necessarily um, Trinitarian relations per se. So um, another question is what, is it common that monks find themselves getting into these dogmatic disputes in these early days and the answer to that one is, this is sort of when they really start doing that. Um, that previously, in sort of the days of Antony, although you could see that Antony was himself, um, uh, you could see that Antony himself was uh, an Orthodox Christian who believed in the Nicene view of Christ and the Holy Trinity, um, it is also the case that he just sort of only gets involved when other people ask him to, basically, which you could argue maybe is what Cassian did here. Um, but by that, I mean that he comes, he starts being claimed by everybody. He, the Nicene Church says, hey, he's one of us, um, but so do a group called the Miletians, and so do the Arians. And so he sort of has to go and meet charges from the bishops in Alexandria to prove his orthodoxy. And he mentions Arians in one of his letters, who sort of has anti-Arian statements, but he is not writing big long treatises the way Cassian does when Cassian is asked to give his opinion on the teachings of Nestorius. Um, so this is sort of a new moment, I would say, the new Nestorian controversy sort of brings out a new moment in these sorts of disputes. And it doesn't stop, basically, from here on in, from like 4.30, um, monks are getting involved in dogmatic disputes. My favorite story about this is at the after the Council of Chalcedon, the, one of the things that goes on at the council is that the Bishop of Jerusalem, a guy by the name of Juvenal, signs off on the doctrinal statements of, Chal of Chalcedon and also gets the title Patriarch as a result of acceding to what the council teaches, but he had previously been involved in a council at Ephesus in the year uh, 449, which Chalcedon completely overturned. Um, Ephesus sort of embracing a guy called Eutyches, um, who's like sort of the extreme opposite of Nestorius, where basically the divinity swallows up the humanity in Christ. And so the monks are like, this guy, he is no good. Obviously, Juvenal has sort of set aside the true teachings of true orthodoxy because he just wants to get this fancy title patriarch. He doesn't care about the truth. And so then this one monk called Theo Theodosius, the monk, well, almost said Theophilus, sorry. This monk the Theodosius actually gets to Jerusalem before Juvenal and he like riles up all these monks, rounds them up, goes to the city, barricades the city from allowing the bishop to enter and the uh, Emperor Marcion actually has to rally the troops um, and besiege the city and people are killed and this monk gets sent into exile. He gets, has to get sent to two places because he is first sent to exile somewhere too close and he keeps on writing letters that are causing trouble. So that's like, no one's writing treatises there, but they are getting deep into ecclesiastical politics uh, in a serious way. 
at that point in history. And sort of this will just continue on. Sort of when you think about St. Maximus the Confessor, he's a monk and he's also the greatest dogmatic theologian of his age. Likewise, uh, St. John of Damascus and just sort of a bunch of others. We sort of are now entering into the age of people who are monk monks um, writing theological tractates and getting involved in the theological controversies of their day. So that's sort of what's going on with that. Um, so, and of course, the question, another question that emerges is that we have these church called the Church of the East, um, which is often called the Nestorian Church or the Nestorian Church of the East and these things. But if you know your ecclesiastical history, isn't the Nestorian Church of the East, doesn't it have its own share of monks? And so what's the deal with that? Sorry, I have my St. Isaac of Nineveh over here to talk to you about that. Here we go, St. Isaac of Nineveh. So because, you know, St. Isaac of Nineveh is like one of the most famous monastic writers of his day. So what's going on there with these Nestorian monks? If these earlier monks are all anti-Nestorians, what's going on with these other guys? Are they not, do they not embrace Nestorianism? And one of the things in terms of the ecclesiastical history of the Church of the East that we need to um, pay attention to is the fact that it is not formally speaking, it does not embrace Nestorius himself or the teaching is associated with his name until the early 600s, something like the year 614. Um, you should read Babai the Great about this. And that I think is actually a really important thing to note that there are people who accept Theodore of Mopsuestia, Diodore of Tarsus, and Nestorius as being Orthodox. And these people are within the Church of the East, but they do not have the ascendancy, formally speaking. They might have the ascendancy in terms of their frequently the Catholicos in whichever city um, the Catholicos is based in at that point in history, but they are not the formal um, ruling party, I guess you might, if you wish to be crude, of the Church of the East until the early 600s. Of course, after which point does come um, St. Isaac. But interestingly, if you read Babai the Great and try to sort these things out, um, what they, how it is that there is the, the sort of, how are there two parsopa um, in Christ? That's the Syriac for prosopon person. And, uh, but then there's also, you know, questions of kenoma, which is, um, has to do with natures and things. Um, what I find interesting though, is that if you read the Eucharistic prayer of Adi and Mari, there is nothing, quote, Nestorian going on in that liturgical text. And this is what they encounter every day. As well, I don't know how frequently the Church of the East celebrates the Eucharist, but that's what they encounter every week, right? Um, so in chapter three of this is the new trans, this is the translation, this is the new St. Isaac book. Sebastian Brock just put it out with St. Vladimir's seminary. Um, so chapter three of that book, Kephalion 149. It's on page 80 if you have a copy. The Lord Christ is both firstborn and only begotten. These terms do not exist in a singleness of nature, for firstborn implies many brothers, whereas only begotten implies none other being born either before or after him. The two names are assured in the God and the man. And so this is the thing. The God and the man who were united in a single person without what belongs to each nature being confused because of the union, which sounds like Chalcedon to me. Um, so if we really want to wade into that question, how Nestorian is the Church of the East, I think also gets into the question of how do they understand the teachings of Nestorius? Because um, if the teachings of Nestorius are represented by Nestorius in 451 or by the worst quotes of Nestorius from 428, those are possibly two different Nestoriuses. And um, I think that's just worth thinking about. And also that it's Nestorius, you could say if, it, if they are Nestorian, it is also Nestorianism as that has been tempered by the ecclesiastical politics of 200 years to more, 250 years by the time of St. Isaac. And so I think that they have sort of been sorting out how to articulate in Syriac um, this need to maintain the fullness of both humanity and divinity and the unity of the person. And so they have found a way of doing that that sometimes sounds Nestorian. Um, and they believe, based on texts such as the Liber Heraclitus, 
um, badly, title badly done is Bazaar of Heraclides in English of Nestorius. Um, texts such as that that seem to show us that that Nestorius at that moment may have been um, teaching orthodoxy. So hopefully that answers that question. See if there are any more questions coming down the pipeline. Um, So I'll have a sip of water. So um, there also arises the question then of Nestorius and Pelagius a little bit and perhaps more, more closely, um, because of course, as Westerners, we are all very deeply invested in the questions of Pelagianism, perhaps not as invested in the question of Nestorianism. Although I think that when you think through these things, I think there's a great glory to be, to be found in thinking through the questions of Nestorianism and orthodoxy. So, um, so yeah, so this is an interesting point that Cassian is the first one who draws this connection between Nestorianism and Pelagianism that basically, and he actually says multiple times that the Pelagian Christology um, is itself a Christology that rejects um, the fullness of the divinity in the humanity of Christ. Uh, because of course, the teaching is that um, he sets a great moral example for us that he is a perfect man and that we can follow his example that we have merely been tainted by the example of Adam. And so the second Adam provides the example we need. That's Pelagianism. And what's interesting is if you look at the people with whom Pelagius and Caelestius were hanging out when they went into the East, one of those people is Theodore of Mopsuestia. Theodore of Mopsuestia is the teacher of Nestorius. Um, you want to find sort of Nestorianism. I've mentioned this a few times, so I'll say it more clearly. There is a, what is the word, family tree. There's a descent, a lineage for the teachings of Nestorius that goes back to Theodore of Mopsuestia and then back another generation to uh, Diodore of Tarsus. And you can read all the worst parts of their stuff in an uh, anthology by John Baer called The Case Against Diodore and Theodore. And Diodore and Theodore, you find things like, I will not say that God was um, three months in the womb and suckled at the breast kinds of sorts of things and a refusal um, to say these dramatic things that draw dra dramatic things that end up um, going hard um, in the subsequent fights between Chalcedonians and the other side of uh, the Miaphysites, things like one of the most holy trinity was crucified and died for us like this really strong God suffered and died for humanity, um, really strongly articulating these to, in such a way and to such a degree that some people start accusing people like Cyril of being patripassians, saying that, oh, well, they're saying that um, the impassable God is passable, saying that the Father is passable, which of course is it's ridiculous to say he's a patripassian. And he only says that God is pass God can suffer in as much as God is fully present in the man Jesus Christ. So Pelagius then, back in the early 400s, when he's running around um, saying things that get him into trouble, spends time and is favorably received by Theodore of Mopsuestia, who has a Christology that is basically Nestorian um, and who is a much more prolific writer than Nestorius. And I think that really it all, it all makes sense to me um, if you actually think about the knock-on effects of either of these two teachings, that if there is an actual division in Christ, whereby there is no communication of properties, where the divine and the human um, do not share with one another, then the moral goodness of Jesus, his ability to be a perfect man, is due to his own 
human self, not due to the fact that he was also God, which means that he's an example. He's not a savior in the way that orthodoxy um, teaches. And so then it relates to Pelagian, uh, I would say to a Pelagian soteriology. And then on the other hand, if you go from the other direction, I put Pelagian soteriology, where Christ's death is ultimately meaningless. Like, why do we need Jesus to die for us if we don't get help from God to save us? We can just save ourselves by our own moral effort through ex extreme asceticism. Well, um, if his death is doesn't save us, is this because they didn't really crucify the Lord of glory in his fullness? Is this sort of the way it goes? Because I feel that you can't say these things um, you can't say these things without thinking it through all the way. Now, perhaps some Pelagian troll will go into the YouTube comments for this later on. Um, I'm not necessarily saying about Pelagius. I'm saying about the sort of the isms. And you can see, nevertheless, you can see how these things can have knock-on effects. Perhaps we'll put it that way. Um, you can see that um, you have to be very careful now, maybe you can be a Pelagian who has an Orthodox Christology, but these guys that we're looking at tonight certainly didn't think that. And I think that's um, just something for us to meditate on and mull over what are the uh, results of these sorts of beliefs that we're looking at, both in terms of Orthodoxy, what are the results of Orthodoxy, and um, what does Orthodoxy really mean for me? Hopefully I showed that. Um, but also, what do the rejected teachings, the heterodox teachings that the church has chosen not to embrace, what do those mean for me? So, um, yeah, I'll see if there are any other questions. Um, So yeah, if there are no other questions, I just want to say that it has been, it was a delight putting this together. I actually just finished teaching a course on the Desert Fathers for Davenant Hall, and I am teaching about the Nicene Controversy in January in Hillary term, as mentioned. So it was really wonderful to put together a lecture that sort of brings together these two interests of mine, these two research and teaching interests that I have, um, and share with you sort of the fruits of my research um, from over these past months in a certain way. And hopefully, um, if you're not able, for whatever reason, to study um, at Davenant Hall, you could share this around when the YouTube comes up or recommend it to friends you know. Um, if you're a clergy person who has a uh, continuing education fund or continuing education requirement, uh, you could think about studying with us. Um, it would be great to see lots of people um, coming into Davenant Hall and uh, we can continue to recruit more members of our army of friends. So thank you once again, and I wish you good night, and have a Merry Christmas as you celebrate the birth of God as a baby.